some specific aspects. So transatlantic trade and investment partnership, the world's biggest trade deal, they say. It's going to taste of the land of milk and honey. Um, it is going to be big because between the US and the EU, you've got half the world's GDP and a third of the world's trade. And the idea is to create a kind of common market for those two entities to make trade between them easier. The problem for them, not for us, is that trade deals typically occur by removing tariff barriers. In other words, getting rid of the import duties. But there aren't any, or they're minimal, between the EU and the US. They're about 3% on average. So we can't have a traditional trade agreement. So what's all the fuss about? Well, having got rid of those trade barriers, they're now moving into what they call non-tariff barriers, which again sounds all terribly jolly. I mean, obviously we want to get rid of these barriers, except that non-tariff barriers are what you and I call regulations, health and safety regulations, environmental regulations, uh, things controlling labor, the finance market. And so they're looking to get rid of what they call trade friction. They actually call these regulations friction because it stops them making money. And now, obviously, a problem for them is that we've woken up to what they're trying to do. And so now they're vociferously denying that they're going to get rid of all these regulations. They're saying, well, no, we're not going to lower the quality in any of these areas. However, it's the only thing that will actually produce any of the benefits they claim. And parenthetically, those benefits are actually minuscule, and we can perhaps talk about that in the questions afterwards. So the issue is, how are they going to produce this lowering of the standards without us noticing? And I'm going to talk about one main way uh, that they will do that, and we can talk about some of the others perhaps later. And I heard from outside that you saw on the film about this Investor State Dispute Settlement, ISDS. And this is really one of the key ways that they will use to lower standards. Um, because it's quite a clever, uh, sort of indirect way of doing that. It's not a new idea, it's been around for 30 or 40 years, and it was brought in when Western countries were investing in emerging countries, because there was a fear that for countries that didn't have a very strong legal system and possibly had corrupt governments, that the investment, your factories, might be expropriated. People might march them with machine guns and say, it's ours. And so the investors put these clauses in bilateral investment agreements whereby there would be an independent tribunal separate from the country where the investment was being made that would allow investors to take an entire country to these kind of tribunals. So it gave them some kind of recourse if they had this expropriation. Um, so it's a basic way uh, for, to bully developing countries. I mean, that's why it was brought in and the countries had nothing that they could do about it. However, the, the companies that started using this found that it was a great way for extracting money. You didn't even actually have to make anything. You just had to claim the government took you or something and then claim some money for it. But they actually found that it was much more important than that because essentially this ISDS puts companies on the same level as countries. And indeed, it actually often puts them above a country's law. Um, so I'll give an example of that. One of the biggest... Um, clashes that we've seen in ISDS is between Ecuador and Chevron. Chevron's uh, daughter company, Texaco, polluted huge uh, areas of the Ecuadorian forest. And eventually, after 18 years of litigation, the Ecuadorian courts awarded $18 billion to the people who had suffered all this pollution. And Chevron, for some reason, didn't really want to pay that $18 billion. Uh, the courts, they went through all the court system in Ecuador and they were still uh, obliged to pay this money. So, because there was a bilateral agreement between Ecuador and the US, they said, right, we're going to take you to one of these tribunals and we are going to claim that we are actually suffering in this case and we will then sue you in that tribunal. And the tribunal agreed and it said to the Ecuadorian government, you must rescind this fine against Chevron and you must actually tell the judges they cannot impose it. And the Ecuadorian government said, well, hang on, we can't do that. Our constitution forbids us interfering with the judicial process. And the tribunal said, tough. It said, we order you to ignore your constitution. So this is a perfect example of how ISDS was used to place a company above a government and force the government, or it's still ongoing, but to try to force the government to go against its own constitution. Another very important case is uh, involving Canada and the American pharma company Eli Lilly. As again I heard uh, from outside, you heard about NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. This was 20 years ago, it has an ISDS chapter in it. Eli Lilly uh, got some patents on drugs, as uh, they frequently do, but then the patent office reviewed those patents and decided they weren't actually valid because they didn't meet the requirements. 
So Eli Lilly obviously went to the courts, tried to get that overturned in Canada, and it went all the way up, to, I think, to the Supreme Court. And the court said, no, you, these patents are not valid. You do not meet the requirements. So now Eli Lilly is suing the Canadian government for $500 million for, and I quote, the indirect expropriation of future profits. Okay. They believe that they have a right to future profits, and that right has been infringed upon because the patents were not given. But the patents weren't given because the patent office and then the courts of Canada said that those drugs did not deserve those patents. But Eli Lilly is saying that through the ISDS mechanism, they can call on a kind of outside world's view to judge what the Canadian Supreme Court does. And the, the final example I'll give, which again you may well have come across, is those very nice people at Philip Morris, who are suing Australia and Uruguay because those two governments have had the insane idea of trying to stop people dying from cancer caused by smoking. So Philip Morris naturally is saying that this is an indirect expropriation of their future profits that they would have had from all those people smoking cigarettes and dying. Now, they're suing Uruguay for $2 billion. We don't know what they're suing Australia for yet, but I imagine it'll be 5 to $10 billion because it's generally based on the economy. Um, so that's a very good example of how health policy, for example, just completely goes to the wind. Just to, to finish off, I'd like to clarify that ISDS will not cause laws to be repealed. We must be very clear about this. So this idea that ISDS is going to attack laws in themselves is wrong. What it does do is it places a chill on all future legislation. Because what will happen is, as soon as people start talking about bringing new laws, for example environmental laws, uh, health and safety laws, companies will send a very polite letter to the government saying you're perfectly at liberty to do that, but we will sue you for $10 billion if you do so. And we know this happens because it happened in Canada. We've actually got Can uh, Canadian officials that were involved that said every time they brought in proposed environmental legislation, they received very polite letters from American law firms saying, we will sue you if you bring it in. And they never brought it in. So it'll basically bring in a ratchet. It'll stop laws being brought in, regulations being brought in, that would cause profits to suffer by virtue of enhanced environmental regulations, by virtue of enhanced health and safety. So this really is the key problem with ISDS, that it will set this ratchet over all governments involved. So it takes away the autonomy of governments, it limits their sovereignty in this rather indirect way, but a, a very powerful way. So I think just to conclude on that uh, note, that this is part of a larger plan really to give corporations a veto on all future legislation in any countries that are foolish enough to accept this ISDS. Thank you, Ken. Just before you go, could you just make a couple of comments on the regulatory cooperation? Okay, thanks, thanks very much. Yeah. Oh, you're going to okay. Sam's going to talk about that. Okay, Sam good. Is, thank you very much, Glenn. That. Yeah, that's a question, but perhaps we can ask the answer at the end. We're going to go into questions later. But do you mind if we. Unless it's, very, very briefly, okay. you can answer it very quickly. Uh, that means that it will make it illegal anywhere in the world to make any effective response to global warming. Well, of course, of course, because if it harms the profits of companies. It depends a little bit on the details, but one thing I should mention is there are 50,000 American companies with subsidiaries in Europe. Any one of those will be able to sue once ISDS in TTIP comes in. They'll be able to sue over any legislation. At the moment, that's not the case because we haven't got ISDS, and those, therefore those companies are not able to sue the European Union. But if we sign up to this, then they will. We can talk about them later. Thanks very much. Who's next?